Welcome to COVID and Climate Change Correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. I want to jump right into it. Um, I had a rather concerning week about our um, about our Steve Keen show. Oh yeah. So yeah, no, actually, this is uh, it. It was kind of upsetting uh, to me. I was going to email you. What um, happened? Well, we got censored by Google. Did we? Yep. Ah, um, what did they do? Well, so YouTube first, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean YouTube. Yeah. Um, so what what they did is they flagged. I think it was episode two. Yeah. Okay. And you were talking about how somebody on Twitter, yeah, uh, was a Q. You got into it with a QAnon guy, and oh, yeah. he accused you of. Now yeah. put this into the chat because the Google algorithms are listening. <laughs> yeah. H O A X. Hoax. <laughs> well, just be careful. Be careful now, right? Because we have one strike on our account now. Because we combine that with the pandemic that starts with a C. <laughs> that word alone, even though you were talking about somebody that was accusing you of perpetrating yeah. or like, um, uh, it, what's the word? Uh, not perpetrating, but like uh, exaggerating a hoax. Yeah. Um, the algorithm stopped it. Oh, good grief. Yeah. yeah. Now, not only this, I don't know why I've disappeared, but not only this, um, I appealed it yeah. thinking, you got to be kidding me. Look at the channel. Like we're, <laughs> it's called COVID and climate correlations, right? And we're yeah. like nonstop yeah. talking about, so I appealed it and they denied it. Oh, what? But they said they hadn't done it? No, they, I don't even think there's anybody that puts any, I don't think there's any human that actually, I think it's like, you know, the adage of a, why is my camera doing that? Yeah, I know you've disappeared completely. Yeah, I can still hear you. Oh, there you are. Right, okay. Yeah. Maybe that's how it's YouTube. Anyways, so, so the, I think it's kind of like that insurance company thing where they just deny the, I mean, it's a little bit of a. In our um, responsibility. Yeah. 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 Or, uh, you know, a little bit of an urban myth combined with, you know, I mean, I'm not really accusing an insurance company of saying that they just deny everything right out of hand, but mm -hmm. that's kind of what it is. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. think anybody looked at it yeah. uh, in context or whatever. And you know, I was thinking to myself, you know, this is going to be a great little start off conversation for our next show because, or this wow. show because the question uh, begs an answer. What do we do about it? So you're saying an algorithm identified a couple of words in a conversation in the entire um, series of videos and then typecast as being the opposite of what we actually are. Exactly. So they're not mm. understanding sentiment, sarcasm. Mm. Yeah. And then after I kind of like my emotions settle down a little bit, like, yeah. you know, I'm like, what? Um, you know, you're falling into a little bit of this, how dare they censor us, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I thought to myself, OK, how else do you run the world's biggest video platform that is free for us to post? Yeah. And you just say, don't say certain things. Not, not that this is a slippery slope to anything Orwellian, mm. but that's part of the conversation. It's like YouTube has such a ubiquitous um, reach mm. that now I'm feeling that we can't say certain things. Um, and maybe that's just because maybe we're just – out of curiosity or, or <laughs> curiosity, curiosity. <laughs> um, yeah, we're just like, OK, we'll stay out of certain realms because we know that's kind of what the system needs to function properly. 
except it should have some overarching classification like, you know, the blue tick on Twitter, that sort of thing, that once you've got that, that's your verification and it would take a lot more than a couple of words to get that struck off. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, the ironic thing here is that as, as, the pro, as the program has developed, we're now on to episode 23, mm. um, which is great. You know, mm-hmm. that's really is. Um, this episode is, st- the, it's still live. I, I think it's in episode two. Um, okay. And the thing was, is it's still up there, the full episode. It's just okay. that I had spent um, a ton of time going through every series. And you'll notice on the channel now, there's a lot of clips up there. All yeah. the way up to so episode 21 or 22. And so... You're probably going to see, um, you know, every day or every second day something on Twitter with an actual video and they're all broken up and they're all highlight clips and everything else like that. Right. So mm-hmm. what, yep. you, what YouTube did is they highlighted the only the um, uh, the clip that I pulled out, you know, oh, yeah. just just a little clip. And so somehow it identified it and struck it off. I appealed it. They denied it. Now there's a, it's actually a warning strike. So this is like, it doesn't, it doesn't count. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Oh, Scott. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it doesn't count yeah. against the, uh, the, um, the account. Um, but, you know, the, the bigger question was, and Scott knows about it. I, I was, uh, I yeah. was venting to him earlier uh, in the mm-hmm. week. But um, I think there's two aspects, you know, I mean, you've got the, you know, the, po- the politics coming up and there's part of me that wants to, you know, get some airtime on this. Like, how do you sensationalize it? Um, <laughs> Steve Keen banned on YouTube. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that didn't have an impact, I think, a small one, but still, yeah. yeah. Well, but, but on the other side of the coin, like, Honestly, like, what are the drawbacks of of sensationalizing that when, you know, you've got a political career that you're about to slip into? Well, it's not, I mean, I think I think it points out that artificial intelligence is more artificial than intelligent. <laughs> yeah. And, well, uh, you know, he, he, in particular, I mean, if you have a, have the algorithm being designed by Americans, there are, that's already behind the eight ball and understanding satire. So uh, <laughs> there are other uh, cultural things that AIs pick up that, that make them even uh, less effective than you'd want them to be. Um, so, yeah, I think it's more about uh, you know, the dangers of AI in that sense than um, uh, saying actual political censorship. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, so I guess the thing is, um, what do you want me to do about it? Do you want me to ham it up and sensationalize it and put a few... Well, it's not a word. I mean, you know, what, how, what sort of? We're not getting a lot of views on the on the program so far, from what I can tell. So, um, you know, why not try to get a bit of notoriety out there? I mean, as you said, what well, the best audience pickup we had was when Vox joined us, and we yeah. got his his viewership. So, you know, we're not cracking. I mean, I haven't promoted it. So, if you asked me to wait a couple of weeks for I did, so I haven't put anything up on my Patreon page about it either. Uh, but it's worth. I mean, it's worth me copying that every week. Um, to go to the patrons, so the patrons want to watch that, or they're like, you know, like the ones who want to listen to the uh, podcast. It's an alternative to the podcast. Um, the other thing that you can do is on your YouTube channel, you can add the, um, you can add the, what is it, like the the playlist, so that it, okay. in your channel it'll show up all twenty three episodes and anything that shows, you know, that 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 we record will show up mm-hmm. on your channel as well. Okay. Um, well, they'll talk me through that later. I won't try to do yeah. it now. But yeah, talk me through it later. We'll get that fixed up. Yeah. So maybe we'll focus mm-hmm. on the clips for now. Um, well, we could always do something on hamming up the, you know, the band. But I was, I was mainly, I was trying to explore the, um, you know, maybe the, the, the common sense side of like, how, how does YouTube manage something of such pure mass uh, and, and and we're talking about public policy too. So you know, you almost like you imagine um, somebody in public policy coming in and say, "Unfortunately, we got to make the rule for everybody." We realize mm. that, yeah, you know, it's like writing an algorithm to shoot down missiles. You know, yeah, uh, yeah, you're yeah. gonna you're gonna shoot down a few birds. <laughs> yeah, and a few of your own side. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, ultimately, the algorithm, it, you, you've got to temper the algorithm with some human knowledge. And partly that's got to go on the credibility of people who are um, part of the, part of the, uh, each of the shows. So maybe that's why I think that the blue tick approach that Twitter has is a, a reasonable one to consider. And uh, once you've got a blue tick, you'd need a lot more than just an algorithm finding a couple of words it didn't like to um, have you being knocked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, moving moving along. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, what's what's happening? Uh, what's what's been going on in the last week in in the world of Steve Keen? Well, the main thing I'm fin- finishing as far as I can finish before I've got to get into the all the politics stuff. I've finished the manual for Minsky, so I'll be putting that up on the on the web in the next few days. Incomplete. It's still got. I, I would. I wanted to finish with writing the section about data fitting, fitting a model to data, but I, I just haven't had time time to finish it before other things have got in the way. And the interesting thing is, we've got we've got feedback uh, accepting with reservation uh, with with revisions the letter we've written to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, critiquing uh, yet another appalling economics paper. Uh, this one supposedly uh, estimating the impact of tipping points on the climate, and. Um, We've clearly struck a couple of neoclassical referees, but we've struck them so hard, they're basically conceding the point and saying, please be nicer about what you're saying. Um, so we've got to, uh, like, for example, they said, you say, you called it economists' estimates. Well, it can't be all economists. <laughs> so I've got to make that almost all economists who've worked on, almost all neoclassical economists who've worked on climate change have made erroneous estimates, something of that nature. Um, but yeah, so that's a positive. At least we're going to get uh, a reply to the you know, ludicrous stuff that neoclassicals put out about climate change. And um, also, there's actually, have you ever, ever read the blog uh, Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist or vice versa? No, but- Okay. Okay. It's, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll just actually um, see if I can locate it and I'll, um, yeah, here we go. Exponential Economist Meets Finite Physicist is the, is the title of the blog. And this this is by a guy called Tom Murphy, who's a physicist, and um, he reports on him um, um, turning up to a, a conference or to a dinner, finding himself seated next to a fairly prominent economist, and then debating with him uh, whether there were limits to growth or not, and realizing pretty rapidly he was dealing with a child when it came to understanding of um, of the physical constraints of thermodynamics. Um, but now he's actually put a book out, um, uh, which actually covers all this material and more. And he's now forming a um, oh, sort of irritating um, hassle with my ear. Pardon me. He's he's now formed a um, a, a thing called Plan P L A N. Finally, mm-hmm. a plan it's called, and it's a plan to take on climate change denialism, and that includes economics, of course. So I've I've signed up for it. A uh, network of academics concerned about the larger challenges facing humanity and saying that we've got too many scattered uh, people in, in different disciplines who don't read each other's work. You know, the whole siloization effect that is one reason why economists got uh, away with the nonsense they've written on climate change to begin with. And uh, so he's putting together a, a, a group of people, uh, Planetary Limits Academic Network Plan. Wow. So I've joined, up, I've joined up to that and I'll be trying to recruit them in saying we really have to throw economists certainly out of any discussion of climate change and mm-hmm. possibly, pre- preferably, out of the academy altogether. Wow. Mm. Well, um, did the, did the uh, Royal Society say anything else other than, you know, you're, you're supposed to, you know, not lump all economists into... Oh, this is, this is actually proceed. There's two. We actually had two, two, uh, two, one article before uh, r- the Royal Society and that got shot down by neoclassical referees. We're writing a reply to that. This was a letter we wrote, just a 1,500-word letter, no more than 10 references and no more than two figures. That's the, the rules, I think, to a letter commenting on a, a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And though there's going to be some drama in getting past the and feedback from the referees, that, that letter is on its way to being published. And they've actually said we'd like you to write an article, which is what we want to do, of course, saying the entire... the in, in, with, with, the, with the sole exceptions of the critics, people like Weitzman and Pindick and a few others, with the sole exception of the critics, there's nothing worth 
So there's nothing worth keeping in the neoclassical economics of climate change. And in fact, they should be banned from ever contributing to it again. Wow. 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 Mm. Um, I'd like to hear more about the uh, um, about the Royal Society and the. Pay so are we are we are we stagnating on the on, on the progress there with it's, that? It's it's, it's just a it's a problem it's a problem just of simple time and resources. I mean, you know, there's only a you know I'm I'm glad I've got a team I'm working with these days, including Tim Lenton, the climate scientist, and Tim Garrett, atmospheric physicist, <clears throat> Matthias Crisselli, mathematician, and then uh, uh, James Ray, another another climate scientist, Brian. Uh, Brian Hanley, a, a scientist and vaccine developer. We've got a team working together. Um, but like in, in between when we submitted our article to um, the Royal Society and, and got the feedback from it, there have been three more articles by neoclassical teams. Uh, and these are you know, large numbers of people working with shared databases they're putting together for all the various perspectives. And this generating more and more of this nonsense that talks about a three a three degree increase in temperature, causing a, you know, a one and a half percent fall in GDP, and at the same time the scientists are saying anything up past one and a half degrees, and certainly anything past two, all bets are off as to the continued existence of human civilization, and um, and so it, it's it, it's how much can one team take on? So what I'm considering suggesting when we get around and have our, our powwow about what to do next it'd be to make these three recent papers the focus. So I'll, I'll bring them up because I just want to show, uh, it's probably you know, rather than talking abstractly about it, it's worth showing what these articles are, are, are like. So, okay. So here's, um, this is the one that I'm most focusing on. I'll just actually put it up full screen and then do screen sharing. Hang on a second. Okay. By the way, we've got. I, I think we're still scheduled for Jurgen Randers to come on on the thirtieth, and yeah, uh, next week we've actually got um, uh, a, a funny a fellow from uh, an um, and an, I think he's like an investor kind of money guy. So um, hmm. I'll, I'll give you some more information about him. But yeah, he, he was an interesting guy. I think he's um, uh, like uh, venture capital kind of. Okay. Kind of, kind of Are you seeing my screen at the moment or not? Uh, not yet. No. Okay. Okay. So it's going to share the whole screen. So this this is the one of the three papers that we're dealing with right now: economic impacts of tipping points in the climate system. Now you you think by looking at that that they're actually understanding what tipping points are. I want to just come down to the punchline. Uh, here we are. Let's see. Yeah. This this particular set of text here. I'll just make it larger. Out of highlighted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tipping points reduce global consumption per capita by about, about around 1% upon three degrees warming and by 1.4% upon six degrees warming. And the, this, the, 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 the subsequent phrases we're looking at as well, based on a second order polynomial fit of the data. So this this lot tell us that the, the, the elements of the of the climate that they are considering tipping, I think it's actually I'll see if I can find the list here. Uh, whereabouts are we? Okay, yeah. So permafrost, gone. Ocean methane hydrates, gone. Uh, SAF, that's the Arctic, uh, the solar Arctic feedback. So that's the Arctic summer sea ice, gone. The Amazon, gone. Um, the Greenland ice sheet, gone. West Antarctic ice, ice leak, gone. AMOC, so the Gulf Stream, gone. Indian summer methane, gone. Tropo. Put those all together, and they will reduce GDP by 1.4%. And you think, what planet are you on to believe making those scales of changes to this planet could cause such a little level of damage to the economy? And and this is typical of this lot. They're, they're so far up their own asses, they can't see that they're regurgitating. Pardon me, I'm going to be frank. They're regurgitating shit and calling it data. And... Um, so I've got to be more polite when I write an article for PNAS, obviously, uh, despite what the acronym sounds like. <laughs> um, but uh, but I'm glad they, they, I'm, I'm glad they call it the proceedings of the, of the, of the National Institute of Sciences. That'd really be difficult. Um, but is there uh, something about climate data that makes it disputable? How could you have no, comp competing no, no. data? I mean. Aren't there watchdog that. organizations that call out liars? Isn't it possible no, to flag 
the, they have a, they have a neuroscience watchdog website where they go through all these really legitimate PubMed articles on, on neuroscience that are just yeah. completely bogus. And he highlights the bogus paragraphs, and then everyone gets on board and says bullshit, bullshit. So maybe you could start a Twitter trend or a website that just calls out liars, puts their faces on there, and this might create some pressure for people not to to lie so boldly and and without fear. Well, the trouble is, if, you know what denial stands for, don't you? Don't even know I am lying. Okay. Now, you've got people who actually think they're doing legitimate research coming up with stuff like this. Um, so it isn't just that they're lying, it's that they're delusional. They've got something delusional in their, in their analytic approach. And if they are only looking in their own backyard, they can't, they can't frame what they're doing and see how totally out of kilter it is with the rest. So it, 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 literally this, this particular paper is discussing tipping points at three degrees and six degrees Celsius of over pre-industrial levels. And they actually model what the world would be like at six degrees if, their, if tipping points weren't triggered and six degrees if they were triggered. Now, the whole idea that you could raise the global temperature over six degrees and not trip every tipping point in the climate is ludicrous in its own right. But they then say that if you could have a planet where you were six degrees warmer and no tipping point got changed versus one six degrees warmer while well, all eight of these tipping points got tri tripped, the difference in GDP between those two planets would be 1.4%. And we're talking a GDP in, say, 2200 that is supposed to be, you know, two orders of magnitude bigger than what we've got at the moment. And it would be 1.4% smaller. Um, so rather than being, you know, say 20, 30 times current levels, it'll be, uh, you know, say, 19.5 times. Um, and and they they don't look outside their own literature and they, they don't even check the veracity of the numbers they're working on. They simply accept anything that's been published must be okay in our field rather than saying, let's get somebody outside the field to take a look at this and say just how sensible is this estimate? And the answer is it's lunacy. So it's... Right. Well, so there's two types of articles. One would be an article that explains the data that it comes up with that, that where the data appears as a conclusion in an investigation. Another article is one like this, where it just extracts something and embeds it in a place where it likes. And maybe that, maybe his footnote refers to another economics paper that also doesn't work with the data, but just implants it from somewhere else. In any case, I bet that if you had someone with some type of connection who put their faces on there and had like a wall of shame, you could do it in kind of a comical like MSNBC way, but mm. certainly, uh, they would wonder, why am I on the wall of shame? What about my it's, paper is wrong? And then there, there might be some incentive to look at it to avoid, avoid being embarrassed. I mean, I know these are juvenile tactics, but maybe a personal approach to attacking lying by attacking the liar would, would work here. It's a reasonable idea, I must admit. I mean, and that's why this idea of what he's calling plan, uh, planetary limits academic network, that, that is a feasible way of doing that because you simply have to call some of this stuff out. And it, it's 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 almost too late to call it out because it's being proven wrong by current circumstances. You know, I mean, their their opinion of a one or two degree increase in temperature actually improved GDP half of these bloody estimates. And we're about the one we're about the one point three you know, between one point two and one point five degrees over already. And their attitude is this is going to be small potatoes. Now, I, I would like to have a wall of shame and say. Uh, but I but I need to have people who can actually back that. In that sense, this um, thing put together by Tom Murphy, where you've got physicists who really know their stuff on the physics of of climate change and physics of you know energy systems, um, could um, could potentially un, un, you know, attack this stuff. I'm going to reach well, out to him. I think that's a great idea. I'd yeah. love to have him on the show. And I'm, I look, I was going to say, uh, you know, Steve, you, you actually do your due diligence. You bring a team. I know you've worked with mathematicians in the past. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're going outside of your field. Um, and I, I think that, I think that's great. What, you know, whether it's with uh, physicists or with mathematicians, sometimes you got to say, Hey, I need some help. You know, I mean, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's why, like, when I first looked at this stuff, I was, it, it, you don't have to be a genius to realise this stuff is nonsense. I mean, I think I told you the story about reading the statement in Richard Toll's 2009 paper about how they got their estimates of damages, and one of them he called the statistical approach, 
uh, saying that they took a look at current correlations between GDP and temperature and assumed that the correlations which apply across space will apply over time as well. And I just thought, you bloody morons. That is so clearly stupid. Um, how on earth can you think that's intelligent? And so I didn't need a physicist. To, uh, uh, you know, common sense is enough to say that's nonsense if you actually understand what climate change is, which is, you know, in the case of global warming specifically, it's retaining more of the sun's solar radiation, um, which is what's going to be heating up the entire planet. And that is totally different to moving from New York to Miami and finding the temperature rises and maybe the GDP falls because the temperature rises. Uh, and, and, then, and then the trivial relationship out of that, uh, it's, it's clearly nonsense. But to really pull them apart, you've then got to have people come in with the physics and say, look, this is, this is insane. Um, in the particular case of assuming what happens across space happens across time, that's actually called the ergodic hypothesis. Uh, and that is a mathematical limitation uh, which applies to systems which are conserving something. So something which is a which is in uh, like if you if you have an area preserving transformation, so you fold a piece of paper uh, into myriad shapes, you don't change the area of the sheet of paper. So your your uh, conservation principle is the area doesn't change, but the distribution may change radically. That's a totally different class of problems. What are called dissipative problems, dissipative systems. Um, so if you have to be very careful, you don't apply the maths of one to the other. Uh, now, what they're doing fundamentally is applying conservative ideas to a dissipative system uh, where what we're doing is actually retaining more energy over time. And if you compare the pl planet now to the planet in 100 years, there's an in you know, gargantuan increase in the amount of retained solar energy. And they're assuming that, you know, that that difference will be no different than changing where you are on the planet now uh, and changing the amount of energy you, you receive from the sun at this instant, not, you know, not, not the, so it's just insanely bad. Um, yeah, and I've got a good team. I mean, it gets getting better with the, with the day. So about eight, eight people now, uh, three from economics and five from other disciplines. And, and that's, uh, you know, we're all non-orthodox economists. So in that case, it's five versus, you know, zero neoclassicals and three non-orthodox. Um, so we just need a lot more to take on economists and say, chuck these morons out of here because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Well, I, I, say, I suggest that we do an experiment. Daniel's good at uh, publicizing videos and titling things. Mm -hmm. So uh, certain titles attract clicks on YouTube, like mm -hmm. people feel like they're getting an inside scoop on something or, or people get the experience, they can cathart their anger at liars mm -hmm. that are exposed mm -hmm. to great liars. So you can have like a top five or top 10 where Steve, where you could go through especially the article right where it's the one I love the most is the one where it says actually we'll increase GDP at this hilarious to so pick the most top five hilarious things. And we can just ridicule them. And, and that would be the top video on Planks. It would just, it would be top five lies that they're punking you with. No one likes to be punked. There's there's inflammatory titlings that we can use that will totally. Be, so if you, you combine ridicule with real criticism and, and, and actual indignation, which is right, all that stuff people love, put it together in, in a simple top five video because these long conversations are great. Long form is great. But a lot of times people want to see a two, a two minute or maybe a three minute video at max. So if, if and people like having factoids that they can be equipped with. So if we yeah, can reduce yeah. all this complexity, the, the worst five papers and the worst five lies, then people would like to memorize that so they can look at smarter parties. And there's all sorts of, of reasons why people would be interested in learning. Yeah, that's feasible. That's a good, not a bad idea. So you've, yeah. you've got the, the, the display. I haven't got the presentation skills, Daniel, as you know. But yeah, you could whack that together quite nicely. Yeah, so you, you could just talk about what you talk about, and Daniel would truncate it into a piece, and then sandwich it with a graphic, and that would be an, an a factoid video. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're perfect for that because I've gone through, and uh, you know, we've got twenty episodes now of of, of smaller segments. Mm -hmm. um, everything has been indexed, and so you're going to see more velocity uh, from me on Twitter with videos. Okay. Um, and and also on 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 LinkedIn. So that's going to start. And Scott's absolutely right. I think we can be. I can be a little bit more mm. um, progressive with the um, you know with the you know the top ten or the you know the the, the, the lists or 
you know, but, you know, Scott's right. Um, I, I've seen this before with public intellectuals. Um, and the example I want to use is actually one from Steven Pinker. I think, you know, he puts out a book, um, you know, like how the mind works, for example. Right. Yeah. And mm. and there's there's what he expects to give the public in terms of this book isn't entirely what the public grabs onto. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a phrase that he used called audible cheesecake. And um, it, he's it, it was something that he th said in passing, but he said it's it's probably going to be an epitaph on his tombstone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, what graphs on the public? And I, I think that the you know, the public does have a huge, um, you know, carrying to it. You, you know, it, it's um, it, if you know, we want to organically get some <laughs> sort of a. Um, uh, ammunition, I would, I would say. So yeah, I think Scott's right. That's uh, mm -hmm. you know gives me. So, so Steve could pick his five, the the, the five papers that may, that irritate you the most. We can go on there, pick one or two graphs from the papers, and then one or two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And I can scale them up with software that so you won't use, lose resolution. We have a bouncing ball moving across the text, and then we'll push that out of the way with the fact frame it could be a, a a slide or it could be a video or it could be a, mm -hmm. a, a bit of lecture refuting it so people like that present the lie show the lie reduce it to something simple destroy the lie next and then you get a five okay. of those in a row it'd be really easy so you can pick your five your top five most outrageous lies and then we'll have the, the top five refuting facts to play right after them and then people will see a b compare cognition a b compare cognition yeah well, even that one example that you said, like a second order poly polynomial, I mean, that's like, really? That's the model they're using is, is know, something it, it so... Is, it's so trivial. It, it just permeates the whole bloody field of economics because uh, like a, a quadratic is easy. If you have an inverse quadratic, its maximum is obvious, okay? Only one inflection point. Um, in the, uh, uh, the point where the derivative is zero. Uh, it's, it's easy for them to use that. And and because that sort of permeates neoclassical economics, they've simply transferred it across to the neoclassical economics of climate change. Like this paper by Dietz, I mean, it's, it is ridiculous. You're talking about tipping points. Tipping points by definition mean an acceleration in the rate of change at some point. Um, and, and yet to do that, it's, it's, I'll see how, how often I find polynomial turning up in this article because, uh, and it's even worse when you read the, uh, the supporting documentation uh, uh, only two times polynomial turns up. Uh, using a second order polynomial to fit the data, two degrees of warming in the absence of tipping points corresponds to 2.3 degrees warming in the presence of tipping points. And you think you're a child, what the hell are you doing? So, uh, so they're redefining tipping point to mean non effect. In, in, well, yeah, what they've done is, yeah, they've, they've redefined tipping points in such a way that they're trivial. So like what that last, that last bit quote that I read is saying that, uh, you know, uh, the impact of eight tipping points uh, is to increase the impact of temperature change by one-sixth compared to the temperature change itself. And, and this is the typical sort of thing that they do. That, uh, That's they, because they have they, six tipping points, Steve, don't you know? Yeah, I know. Just, the, the bastards will use this stuff. Say, oh, you're keen doesn't know what he's talking about. They've included tipping points ever since Dietz, Rising, Stork, and Gerno Wagner, I might add, who gets a bit of kudos for being a reasonable neoclassical. I'm sorry, he's lost it with me over this particular paper. Uh, but, yeah, they'll say, well, we've already covered that. What are you talking about? And they just wave their hands and say it's already been done, you know. And this is the thing. They, they do it so badly, but it's it's buried and beneath an enormous amount of econometrics, it's intimidating for enough people not to read uh, to realize there's got to be something totally wrong with the logic. Yeah, I think Scott's right. The other avenue I think would be to, wouldn't it be amazing if we could get the, the physics community uh, behind us? I mean, I, I, I think they're um, they're a very powerful group, I think. Well, that's, that's rather I'm glad to see that uh, Murphy has put this together yeah. because... I mean, my opinion is that, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been attacking neoclassical economics for 50 years now. I started fighting it in July of, of 1971 as a first year undergraduate student when I realized just how full of holes it was. Uh, but 
they just don't belong in the university. They don't belong in academic settings whatsoever. They don't, they don't belong in intellectual tradition. It is a primitive way of thinking about the, the world that they have themselves unintentionally disproven its foundations and ignored those disproofs. Uh, and yet what it generates a Dunning-Kruger effect where these people believe they've got the right to take on any other field, including climate science. Now, if any physicist turns up and takes on economics, they scream, you know, this is our territory to get off it. They've, in fact, invaded climate science and they're giving conclusions that climate scientists wouldn't even contemplate uh, as reasonable results from their analysis, such as, you know, six degree increase in temperature, and this is quoting Nordhaus now, will cause an 8.5% fall in GDP. That's without considering tipping points. So you add in Dietz and Wagner, at least a simple addition, of course, uh, eight major tipping points will add an extra 1.4% to the damages. So, gee. 10% fall in, in GDP one or 200 years in the future when that we expect that GDP to be 10 to 30 times higher than it is right now. And you know, yeah. they, they, it, it, it is, it's suicidally dangerous for humans to continue tolerating this way of thinking. Now, am I distracting the conversation and the, 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 the thrust of this argument by saying that even the, the, the fixation on GDP is the is a problem. Uh, no, it's 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 what's what's happened is it's it's trimming down all these issues to a couple of simple metrics. So, like GDP, I actually do find a remarkably close match between change in GDP and change in energy consumption, and that confirms a sort of point that I see from a number of researchers that uh, GDP is fundamentally uh, energy transformed with energy from you. Know, useless forms to useful forms of energy and using the same to go from forms of matter we can't exploit to forms of matter we can. So in that sense, there is some solid backing to GDP. But what they've done is reduced global warming simply to temperature, okay. not looking at any of the other consequences in any real detail, um, and and then fit, fitted that within a framework where uh, it's it's this impact you'd have on temperature by moving away around the planet rather than changing the amount of energy the planet retains from the sun itself. Um, so I'm going to get, a bit, get lost there. I'm just, I'm so, you know, it, it is so disgusting that this stuff even got published. Um, and the, tr the trouble is it is the stuff which has meant we've done nothing of any significance for 50 years in terms of addressing climate change. So... It, 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 we, we have to get the physicist in there to say, kick these bastards out of the academy. Wow. Let's talk about AMOC for the, the shutting down of... Oh, the AMOC, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of the go-to. We've, we've talked about it a few times on the show. And um, I'm trying to think. It's, it's, I would say that it's um, larger than regional, right? Um, it's continental, but it's, it's going to be the Atlantic side of... Um, of Europe and um, I, I, you know, there's you'd explained it to me before, where you said that there's an equalization of of temperature, but uh, a dramatic fall in overall temperature because of the slowdown of of the uh, of the currents in the Atlantic Ocean. Actually, um, what, what, what I just found a found a little website that gives a, a has has a reasonably good graphic to show what's actually going on because. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll actually I'll just make it a bit larger here and then go back to the screen share once more. Okay. Okay, so that's the Thermo Highlands circulation. It, it unites the northern, so, you know, the, in, the oceans of the entire planet are caught up here. And what you have is, this is Antarctica, obviously, and you've got a cool, obviously cool uh, flow of, of you know, water in the deep ocean there. And then as it gets comes up in the Pacific, it gets heated for obvious reasons. And then you get it coming to the surface and flowing along the top as hot water, which flows right down here around the Cape, again gets reheated here. And this is the section we call the AMOC, the Atlantic, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So you have heated water coming up through uh, from the from originally the Pacific, but also across the tropical regions of the Atlantic, getting up to here to Greenland and the Arctic region and getting both colder and also changing its salt level. And I'm not sure which way it goes one way or the other. I'm not the expert on this stuff. 
uh, but then changes in the salt level of change temperature mean the water falls back down again, subsurface and comes back around again. Now, what's, what's happening with the idea of the AMOC slowdown is that if you significantly increase the amount of fresh water coming here, so you therefore drop the salinity up here, that will cut this circulation off. So effectively what you'd have is this circulation would stop here and, you know, turn around and come back down again, meaning the effect on the temperature of Europe would be between 3 and 10 degrees Celsius fall in temperature. And, you know, if you, if you want to imagine, I mean, it, it, and it would happen very suddenly. Um, the, 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 the general impact, people were thinking it would take 100 years for this to happen. But now more recent research is saying it's slowing down by about something in the order of the strength of the current slowed down by about 15% in the last 10, 15 years. And the worry is that it could fall precipitously with the rate of melting of Greenland. And so that tipping point could cause this tipping point to go. And then very suddenly, we could have a Europe several degrees cooler, but the heat would still be there. This is just a distribution system for existing heat. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is there'd be more heat here and less heat there, and therefore a much stronger temperature gradient going up this way, meaning you're more likely to get much more powerful storms that will hit both Europe and, and parts of North America. Mm -hmm. So where I was leading with that is that the, 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 the GDP for those individual countries directly affected by that, um, mm. you can't take a universal drop in GDP and that you have to take more regional drops in GDP. Well, that, 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 that's, part, that's part of the problem because what is the picture, picture paper that, that talked about shutting down the thermohaline circulation as being a good thing was by Antoff Estrada and my good friend Richard S.J. Toll. And they literally just said that uh, all, we, all we did looking at, and this is why I said it's, it's, it's the way they've reduced the scale of what's happening to trivial, to trivial measures. So GDP on the one side, temperature on the other. So they've said, well, temperature is going to fall uh, because of the AMOC dropping down. Temperature is rising because of global warming. One counters the other, and this is good. Now, what they haven't looked at, and this is a, to take, take another approach on what happens if we, use, if we lose the uh, the AMOC. This is from Hansen, Jim Hansen, who obviously knows his stuff on climate science. And what he's said of a much, a much more sophisticated uh, uh, climate global warming uh, model, he said that if you have that fall, you get a 10 to 20 percent increase in the strength of storms. And therefore, that means a doubling in the damaging power of the storms because the, sp the power is, is the cube at the speed. So if you've got 1.2 cubed, you've got you know, pretty close to two times the amount of power, and the storms that will occur will be that much more devastating. And looking back at the Eemian period, which is about 130,000 years ago, which is the last time the AMOC shut down for, by natural causes, uh, if, I'll have to show you an image of, the, uh, of some of the boulders he said were hurled um, by, the, by, by waves, not by tsunamis here, but just by storm waves. And he said you had 10... You know, thousands of tonne limestone boulders hurled 40 metres, uh, you know, uh, you know over, over ridges uh, by waves that were 40 metres high. So if you wow. can imagine, you know, storms like that turning up, well, imagine our port system, of course, is designed to handle 40 metre waves. It's not. Um, so all, all this stuff is what they're ignoring uh, and trivialising and just reducing it to temperature in particular locations. So I think, in fact, the, the fact that they've regionalized that has made their work worse, not better. You're, so wait a minute. I, I, I don't. I, I want to really stop here. And this is a shutdown of regional economies. This is like all of. I mean, potentially, right? Mm. This is all of uh, Amsterdam shutting down their economy, and yeah. you know, global if, if GDP small, drop. I if, get that, but it doesn't. Yeah. Like th this is this is really a big, you know, cascading effect when all of a sudden. Uh, you know, Amsterdam or 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 England or France or you yeah. know Germany has this. Well, Vancouver is it? Is it not Van yeah. is it Vancouver in your country that's been cut off? Storm damage has cut off the major port of your country. Yeah. Uh, again, again, as it, I just, I mean, I made some comment a few programs ago that I thought there'd be more damage in the northern hemisphere than um, than um, in the, the equatorial regions, and that's starting to happen. Um, you know, so bloody Canada. I mean, that's, if you want to see the country that's had the worst impact from climate change in the last year, I think 
Canada's your answer. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't really yeah. think about that, but I mean, I mean, where we are, the forest fires, we we go from a season of forest fires, uh, you know, to uh, you know floods. Um, there was a city close to where I'm living that completely had to be evacuated, and there was a um, like a landslide, you know, b- burying you know people and stuff like this. I don't actually I don't know for certain if if people were buried, but I mean it's just it's just nuts. And 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 you know we were without power. I actually I went to bed last night thinking, what am I going to do? How do I get on our show? you know, tonight, if, if we still don't have power, right. I mean, the power came on the five at five this morning. It, it, it's, it's, it's like constant. There's like power loss and shortages on, on Vancouver Island constantly where, where I live. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. And, and here's the thing you think about what are we going to do for our children? What are we going to, I had a crash there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I thought you were just deep in contemplative thought there. You see that? <laughs> mm. I'll change my background again. Hang on a second. Let's go back. Get rid of my ugly background here. Yeah. But I'll um I'll I'll I'll, I'll just end that point and like the the idea of the of the kinds of skills and the survival skills, the life coping skills that 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 young young kids are going to have to. Um, I have to be able to cope with just life. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I'm, it, it, you know, that's upsetting to me because, you know, we're, we're not preparing younger generations, even if we're going to, I heard, a, I heard something on the CBC, which is the Canadian broadcast network. Yeah. Um, and they were saying there, there is a combination. There is a real, um, uh, you know, valid aspect to the conversation about reacting, about mm-hmm. trying to have, the skills and the people in place to be able to uh, like disaster relief. Right. I mean, this needs to happen. And on the other side of the coin, then there's the larger picture of trying to combat, you know, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, but there's Mm -hmm. also, you know, what are we doing on the ground to be able to alleviate people and get services and, you know, you know, all of these that, types that, of that's, things. That's all stuff we're trying to do within the within the confines of the current social yeah. and economic system. And if you're getting storms like you got in Vancouver, which mm-hmm. wipe out the uh, all rail and road connections to that city, you can't disaster prepare for that. No. Um, it, it, it's the scale of the amount of energy involved and the way that's dissipated and what that does to the stable environments in which our societies evolved. It's just destructive. Yeah. Um, and so it's beyond any level of saying, you know, how do we disaster? How, how can we plan for this disaster? <laughs> Only way to plan for it is not cause, the, not cause the systemic change in the first place that made the disaster happen. So what's, um, what are your feelings now, um, you know, two, two weeks after, you know, COP26? Oh, it, 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 I think COP is a cop out. It's fairly well, well described. Uh, the, at least they've got a statement about the need to phase down, not phase out coal. So there's some focus on that particular aspect of climate change. Uh, but there's still no way in which people are taking this as an existential threat rather than something we need to optimise. And, and that's my overall problem. People think, oh, we can't, we've got to trade this off against that. Um, well, you know, you, you can't, as a lemming, you can't trade off um, you know, being alive versus falling over the edge of a cliff. You know, the sum of the two is you're dead. Um, just don't fall over the cliff. And the, the trouble is we have something which is existential, which is being treated as, as as an offset. You know, how do we offset the cost here against the benefit somewhere else? And that's entirely the wrong framework if what you're talking about is existential crisis. You do not cross that line. You do not jump off the cliff. Yeah. Um, so th- there's no sense in which that is the awareness of COP26 and, or any, any of the previous ones. And I think partly the problem is, in, in some ways, that climate scientists have tried not to be too alarmist. But I think that's a mistake. I think they said, look, this is life and death. Past a certain point, we can't guarantee uh, the existence of 
the support systems you take for granted. And in fact, past which you point pretty good to cope, cope that they're just not going to be able to survive the forces we're unleashing. So um, the, the, I, mean, I don't think there's going to be, and the economists will play a huge role here. If we take on a gradualist approach to this starting 50 years ago under the influence of the guidance of the limits to growth, yes, we could have done it slowly. Okay? It's too late. So I, I, I think it's, um, we won't actually have any of these institutions treating it as an existential crisis until it becomes one. Yeah, that's a good point to, you know, talk about J- Jürgen Randers in a couple of weeks. I mean, he must mm. be, you know, just just dying inside, right? I mean, it, it, a slow death. And it's like his research was, you know, uh, you know, pivotal in pointing that out. And we've just ignored it, really. Something happened yeah. with the Democrats and the progressives, especially in the U.S., the Republicans embarrassed them, and now they think they have to make everything sound middle of the road and moderate. They don't want to be associated with the, the long-haired, dangerous, upsetting Black Panthers, revolutionaries, Marxists, and all this stuff. So you're right. You know, Greta Thunberg is the only person who expresses the proper emotion when delivering this information. And everyone mm-hmm. else, by, by just being a complete monotone talking head, they think that they're going to infiltrate middle America with their with their their mild mannered presentation, but that's not the right mode. Yeah, and, and that's what I think Greta's done a, a good service by making it confrontational. But even she's still being treated as a sideshow uh, by all these groups. Now, if you actually had Greta making the decisions, I think we'd find ourselves under carbon rationing straight away um, and, 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 and massive redistribution of income as well. And those are what are needed. But, you know, there's been absolutely no conversation about that at any of these institutions. So I can't see us doing anything until after we find ourselves experiencing existential threats. And again, as I said, Canada seems to be leading the way in that. And uh, we're only into the second, you know, the second year of the of the twenties. You know, um, I think that one of the defining characteristics of humans um, is something that we're not very well um, demonstrating right now in history. And that is the fact that we can abstract and we can extrapolate into the future and we can see further than, you know, other animals. Um, But it doesn't appear that we are looking far enough. Oh, yeah, I think our capacity to model can also delude us. Um, And that's what would happen. I mean, if you look at what the scientists have done and with seriously good models and, and true peer review of those models, uh, the, the caliber of their work has improved dramatically over time. It's just what's happening with the economists. It's just yeah. their modeling that, are, yeah. that is criminally bad, but it's so crucial because we see ourselves as an economic society. We don't see ourselves as a scientific society. Okay? The economic society wouldn't exist without the science, but the people doing the economics have never understood science and, and, and never interface with it. And the worst representatives of that are the ones who are determining how economists think about climate change and therefore affecting the political discussion. That's why I've become, I was once accused of trying to conduct a purge. And that was by Noah Smith, actually, way back at about 2012. Uh, And he's right. I want to purge the entire world of neoclassical economists before they purge the entire world of life. Wow. That's uh, really crazy, Scott. On a uh, uh, on a, um, in the field of philosophy, what's your intuition? We only have f- about five minutes left, but what's the, what's the intuition from um, the field of philosophy? Why why are not more philosophers trying to tackle this? Similar to way you know maybe a um, uh, a physicist might you know jump into this field, like. W- What's the reservation generally just overall with with the field of philosophy? What's what's the problem? I can't speak for the field of philosophy. I don't know what's happening. I don't even know how climate science is fitting into the philosophy department academic curriculum. I know about deep ecology. I know that it exists. And uh, some of these guys are pretty uh, vocal and um, and they get out there where they can with megaphones and they join protests and stuff. But I really don't know what's what's going on and I'm not sure how academics are infiltrating places that count which I guess is up to 30 seconds on CNN once or twice a week 
I'm not sure how to get information to count. I, it probably isn't at a at a at a uh, a, a seminar or a conference because academics will hear other academics and say, "Yes, it's a shame," but then that outrage and or data needs to leave the conference and and spread out and then affect whom who 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 do we want? We want CEOs to listen to it, I suppose, or maybe politicians. Are those the people that we that are supposed to care about it? But then they're working for other people. They, they became politicians in order to get kickbacks. There, there are no real politicians in the U.S. except maybe three. So I don't know. Maybe that's too pessimistic. I shouldn't have said anything. Yeah, well, again, it's all done about the economists, unfortunately. They're the ones who set public policy in general. Philosophers would be ridiculed if they tried diving in there unless they took on the economists in the first instance. They're the main enemy. Hmm. Well, nicely said. We've got uh, just a few minutes, and uh, I, I mean, I think that's a nice summary. We're right at the top of the hour, and uh, I want to thank you both for coming. Um, unless there's anything else you guys want to say, uh, again, thank you, and we'll see you both back next week. Yep. I think I better depart. I've got to tell them we're going for lunch, so I'll see you all guys later. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Good night.